routes of administration. We use four different ways of administering ketamine in our clinic. Each one is a little bit different um, as far as the experience that the client or patient has and the experience um, of the session from the point of view of you as the provider. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, each of these methods, I'm going to do further videos with more information breaking down the details. In other words, how do you do it? How do you dose it? How do you set it up? Today is really about the overview of the broad concepts. So you'll understand that there are these four different ways and what the differences are. So I've drawn here some very simple curves and we're gonna go through this. This is a graph of session time on the bottom this would be approximately a 40 minute um, window. So this would fit within a therapy hour. And this would be examples of doses and ways that we may give ketamine in our clinic right now with our clients. And then on this axis here, you have intensity. This is the intensity of the experience from the point of view of the client. Um, this is really correlates with blood levels. So the first curve that you see here labeled one is IM or intramuscular. This is a really common one that some of you have experienced and certainly know people who may have experienced or have heard about this. Um, this one is an injection, an intramuscular injection of ketamine, usually into the shoulder, as a one-time bolus. And because of the way ketamine is metabolized, um, this usually shoots up relatively rapidly in the, in the intensity of the experience. Your highest intensity part of the experience will be that first 20 minutes or so, and then it's going to pretty exponentially come down um, from there for the like, second 40 minutes or so of the session, second half hour or so of the session. <laughs> so what the experience is of the client um, is that the, it shoots up kind of quickly, it feels intense. This is the more psychedelic part of the dose if that's the, depending on how many you know milligrams you're giving them. And then they'll start to feel it wearing off and it'll wear off relatively rapidly in, in that sort of a shape. So I wanna compare that to the IV route, intravenous route. Um, this is putting someone on an IV. Um, this is often, um, this would be similar to the IV process that people go for in a regular ketamine clinic um, treatment protocols, but we're using it here as a psychedelic and we have a lot of experience doing it that way in our clinic. The advantage of this one is it comes up a little more gently, doesn't peak as much. You can maintain this dose for a sort of more usable amount of time with a plateau. So as far as having the ability to um, have some predictability with um, your ability to, the client to feel oriented at a certain, to a certain degree or have a conversational give and take, you're not having as much change as you are with the IM, you're having a sort of steady state here. And then it wears off somewhat gently you can control based on how you program the IV, um, how long you want the whole thing to last. You can also control how high it goes. So you could also go up here, obviously. That's about, that has a lot to do with the dose. But what I want you to notice here is the shape of this. And then I've put this sort of up and down line here because um, one of the huge advantages of IV that people don't often talk about is it's um, titratable. So even when it's already running, you and the client can collaborate to turn it up or turn it down to increase or decrease the intensity. So it's flexible, um, depending on what's going on in the session. Um, you can adjust it while you're in there, but even if you don't do that, it usually kind of sways in and out of a relatively stable dose state for this chunk of time, maybe 30 minutes, and then trends down here on the end um, somewhat gently. So this is a quite a different subjective experience. Um, I've drawn these curves to represent sort of typical dose ranges we use at our clinic, but obviously I think um, it's worth pointing out that any of these curves can be stronger or milder depending on the dose. So if I give you a stronger IV, you'll, you'll go up here and you'll, you'll stay up here. If I give you a lower dose IM, you'll have a peak down here maybe, but it'll wear off like that. So the shapes of these are what I want you to notice because the shapes are determined by the route of administration the intensity of this really depends on the, the milligram amount that you're using. So we've talked a little bit about advantages or disadvantages of IM versus IV. And then the next one I have here, number three, is another common one called sublingual. You often hear this referred to as a trochee or a lozenge. Um, this route of administration has some advantages in that it also has a somewhat gentle onset and it tends to plateau somewhat steady state for a long time. 
some of the disadvantages are um, people don't like holding it in their mouth. It doesn't taste good and it's somewhat um, uncomfortable or inconvenient in that way, though people can adjust to that. Um, a couple of the other disadvantages, though, that are worth noting with the lozenge are, you see this curve goes off the page here. You're not going to be able to keep this within um, a 40 to 60 minute session hour as far as the psychedelic time, because these are tend to be two plus, maybe two to three hour appointments. Um, the, the lozenge lasts a long time. It takes longer to wear off. And so you, that needs to be part of your decision making as far as how you schedule it or what type of session you are designing for your client. Another potential disadvantage with lozenge that um, if it isn't spoken about that often is this um, tendency to have an after wave or a sort of after peak later in the day accidentally. Um, this is because um, the sublingual route is separate from the oral route of absorption. So the sublingual dissolving under the tongue through the sublingual mucosa is how this is designed to work. But inevitably people will swallow parts of the dose even unintentionally. And sometimes they're instructed by providers to swallow it intentionally. So that all of those are strategies depending on what, you know, what you're trying to achieve and, and what you're used to working with. If you are absorbing some of this dose orally, you can have a situation where you sober up you feel good, you're ready to go home. And then after you get home hours later, you could have like an accidental peak of medicine that kicks into your system later because of the delay with the oral absorption. Um, there are ways to mitigate this and strategize with your client to minimize this happening. But it is a potential downside of lozenge that it's important to just put out there that you don't have with these other routes. So lastly, number four, I put down here, IN is intranasal. A lot of you are used to thinking about intranasal in the context of this bravado um, Johnson & Johnson product. I am talking here about something different. I'm talking about compounded nasal spray design for CAP, for psychedelic work. The nasal spray is extremely versatile. The reason I haven't drawn a curve for it is because you can do almost any curve. You can mimic any of these three curves with a nasal spray or some variation. You could some make something more like this that ends sooner or you can make something like this that peaks twice. So it's really flexible and very underused in ketamine assisted psychotherapy or CAP. So a nasal spray, the, um, the amount that's in the spray can be compounded anywhere from say five to 20 milligrams. And then the amount of sprays that you give someone can be adjusted. You can give them more or less. And then the amount of times you would administer booster doses and when you administer those, so all of that flexibility allows you to design a psychedelic dose on a nasal spray that's very flexible and can create almost any type of experience. Um, it's also affordable and pretty accessible for people. So it's a tool that definitely um, needs to be trained in more by people going into the CAP world so that they have a better understanding of, of how to use it. And um, we train people in all four of these models. The idea being that if you can experience all of these yourself, and then use how to work with all of these different models with your clients. You really have a versatile toolbox to pick from. And when you're working with a client, you can collaborate with them based on their goals, on what type of experience they're most comfortable with or what might be most therapeutic for them. And you can also combine these routes in the course of a single client's therapy, um, depending on your goals. So in some ways, ketamine is our most flexible psychedelic a sense of your ability to use it in the clinic in all of these different ways. So let's talk about the pros and cons of these different routes that we've mentioned and some of the factors that may lead you to decide to use one or the other with your clients. Starting with number one, intramuscular. The advantages of this are it's easy to use, it's accessible and widely available, and it does fit within the 40 to 60 minute typical psychotherapy window. The potential downsides of this one are there is a rapid onset into a relatively high dose, as you can see by the shape of the curve, which can be jarring for some clients and is usually not the best choice if you're using this for the first session in someone who has trauma or who is experiencing a lot of anxiety around being in altered states. You also do not have any control over this dose or ability to titrate it once you've administered it, 
once it has been injected and it's in the bloodstream, it will metabolize out um, based on the kinetics of the medicine and you have no ability to adjust up or down once you've administered it. And then another potential downside is um, people who are really uncomfortable with needles, given that that may be a component of set or setting to factor into the psychedelic experience. The bioavailability of this route is quite high, 93%, meaning the dose in milligram amounts would not be that different from that used in the IV context. Moving on to number two, IV. Um, the advantages of this one as discussed is that it's very flexible, very titratable. You can control how high or low the dose is in a session and you can even adjust that up or down at varying points or times in the session um, so that it, depending on your therapy goals. And you can also control how long it lasts. It has a gentle onset and a relatively gentle um, wearing off curve, um, which is another way that it's differentiated from the IM. Disadvantages of this are cost and accessibility. And again, there is needles involved. This is intravenous. And so if that medicalized um, aspect of set or setting is working, uh, um, something that your client struggles with, that's something to factor in. Bioavailability is 100%, meaning that the full amount of the medicine administered makes it into the bloodstream. Moving on to number three, the sublingual route, the trochee or the lozenge. Advantages of this are, again, accessibility. This is widely available and relatively affordable. And um, another advantage is it does, like the IV, have a gentle onset. It's not as abrupt. Potential downsides are, um, one, it is often unpleasant to administer in the sense that clients don't often like the taste um, or the sensation of having to hold the liquid in their mouth and it can contribute to nausea more than the other routes for those who are sensitive to that. It also has a longer and more unpredictable duration of action. Um, so unless you are prepared as a clinician to schedule two to three hour therapy windows, um, this may not be available to you or to your client. And you do not have the ability to control it or titrate it again once it is administered, similar to the IM route in that way bioavailability of the sublingual lozenges is 30 percent meaning that about a third of the dose the total milligrams you're administering will make it into the bloodstream so that's factored into dosing strategies as well number four intranasal i have not drawn a curve for that because like i said this one is very titratable similar to the iv and has a lot of flexibility you can create almost any dose curve with it and that is one of its bigger advantages. The duration of action similarly is very flexible. Um, the nasal spray lasts about 20 to 30 minutes. So if you want a longer session time, you can easily do that using boosters or redosing the, the client partway through in a timed manner. This again is accessible, widely available and affordable. And therefore it's one that we consider a pretty good option for people because of its accessibility and titratability. Um, potential cons of this are that it does require booster doses and that can be disruptive to the client and the therapist if they're not trained on how to do that. And so that may not be everyone's choice. And it also involves um, a pretty careful time tracking on the part of the therapist because the timing of the booster doses will be critical in how the session is um, to, to create the dose curve or the type of session experience that the client is, is hoping for and, and planning for. The bioavailability of the intranasal route is 45%, so we usually estimate about half of, of the milligram amount that is administered will be will make it in the bloodstream compared to say the IV route and again that is factored into dosing. Lastly, remember that these methods can be combined um, even in a single session. So there is a lot of flexibility built into the use of ketamine once you develop a sophisticated understanding of it and the ways to work of working with it in a nuanced way. So I hope this has been a um, 
a sort of simple but clear introduction to the idea of the differences here. And we will break this down a little bit more in future videos as far as the specifics of how to do this. Thank you, and I'll see you for part two of ketamine information in the next video.